As a basis for our study this morning and probably at least the next couple of Sunday mornings, notice God's message to Samuel as recorded in 1 Samuel, the third chapter, verses 11 through verse 13. When it says, And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle, and that day I will perform against Eli all those things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I began, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the, iniqu for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. This message to Eli from God is a message of doom and gloom. It tells of coming judgment that God is going to bring upon them. And not only upon Eli himself, but his entire house. We might think that Eli was some evil, ungodly person. We can't even, you know, you look at a cold-blooded murderer and standing before being judged, and I doubt that there would be any stronger condemnation than what we read here. Eli is being sentenced to death. And sharing in that death was his loved ones. So let's, let's look at this man, Eli. From what we read here, as we mentioned, uh, we might think that Eli was some corrupt, evil individual. That's, that's what is almost presented to us in the text. My thinking, if, if we did not... <coughs> If we did not know him, we might think that he was maybe some vile murderer, an uh, evil man in disposition, character, that he was some ungodly person that finally the judgment of God is coming upon him. He, is a, he must be some great evil sinner that God is going to judge. That's what's presented to us in this small sampling of Eli. And what we might conclude if we did not know any better. But instead, Eli was a very pious man. He was very religious. He was an aged priest. He had judged Israel for 40 years. During that time, those 40 years in which he was judge, as a judge, being a deliverer of God's people and a leader of those people, he would be hearing God's message and he would be God's spokesman to the people during that time. That's what leaders would do during that period if they were faithful to God. They would hear God's message. They were leading the people, and thus they would set forth what God had said to the people. That's what Eli had done for 40 years. And as we look at his life, we don't see any outward evil. We don't see any outward sin in his life. You know, some individuals, you know, we can... Even though they might have been great in some respects, we see some evil in their life. We see sin within them. Yet for the 40 years that Eli judged Israel, we don't see any of that type of a nature in Eli. We don't see 
any aggressive sin that he or crimes that he had committed. He was, from all intent and purposes, he was a good man. If we looked at his virtues, he was now an old man, but he had a youthful heart. Samuel had been brought to him to serve him. And the Bible tells us uh, Samuel loved Eli. Eli loved Samuel. Here's an older man with a younger man. And they loved each other. Now I realize the homosexual community of our day would love to blow this out of proportion. There's nothing of that nature in this relationship between Samuel and Eli. But they did have a love one for another. At sunrise and at sunset, it depicted them as walking arm in arm with each other, talking with each other, conversing with each other. And no doubt, Eli, being the, an older man at this point in time, teaching and instructing this young man, he had been, Samuel had been placed into his care. He was a generous man. For long years, 40 years, he had also, or he had also served as a priest. But now then he is also being set aside for a younger man, Samuel, to take his place. In those type of situations, many times what we will observe is that the older man who is being set aside for the younger man tries to undermine the work of the younger man, tries to destroy his credibility, tries to do things to harm him, to take him out of the way. We have seen that, and I'll just mention with preachers many times. One who is a preacher and who retires at a congregation, and they hire someone to come in, and the older man starts undermining him, trying to destroy his work and his credibility so that soon that younger man has to move off. You didn't see any of that with Eli and Samuel. It speaks well of him. He doesn't rebel against this. He realizes that this is the way it should be. He's not growing bitter. He's not giving way to envy. He's not saying bad things about Samuel or trying to undermine him in any way. Eli was also a man of fine spiritual insight. Those who are older can provide spiritual insight that younger people many times never see. That's what we see with Eli and Samuel. There came a night that... God speaks to Samuel. It's recorded in 1 Samuel, the third chapter. And so the first time that Samuel hears, <coughs> hears the word of Yahweh, he goes into Eli. Here I am. You called for me. And he realizes, no, I didn't. Go back to bed. God speaks to him a second time. He runs to Eli. Here I am. You called for me? No, I didn't call for you. In verses 8 and verse 9 then, it says that the Lord called unto Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am. 
for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Eli had that spiritual understanding that Samuel did not possess at that time. It says, therefore, Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And we know that God then spoke to Samuel, or to Samuel uh, that fourth time, in which Samuel responded as Eli had stated. That was the knowledge and the wisdom of an older man giving it to that, his insight to that younger man who's growing and developing. It very well might be that Eli realized that man cannot direct his own steps. Man has to be taught. We start teaching at the very youngest of age. And then we continue that teaching even as they grow into youth and then adulthood. And even as young adults, they still need that teaching and that spiritual insight which those who are of age people might be able to give. That's why no doubt... <coughs> No doubt why the Bible repeatedly, in Proverbs especially, talks about the need to honor the hoary head, the gray-headed man, because he's demonstrating that age. God required that those who take the oversight of a congregation must be elders, that is, older because there is a spiritual insight that many times they possess that the younger people don't possess. Well, that's the way it was with Eli. And many times what we see is, well, you know, I don't, this, all this that I, wisdom and knowledge that I've gained, I'm just going to hoard it up for myself. <clears throat> Not going to share it with anyone. Not going to do anything to help anyone else. I've done this through the sweat and toil of my work, and they can do it that way themselves. Eli wasn't like that either. He was willing to give and share with this young man, Samuel. But then... We're still troubled by what then we read in our text in 1 Samuel, the third chapter. That God is going to bring judgment upon the house of Eli and Eli himself. And so we wonder if Eli was a good, pious individual if he was religious, if he, we don't see any great evil within his life, why was this severe judgment pronounced not only against Eli himself, but against his house? And yet, we cannot find any great evil. And so we're prompted to ask, well, what's wrong? Why is this being done? He was a good man. He was religious. He worshipped God. He had a spiritual insight that he shared with others. Why is God going to put Eli to death and his entire house? Well, the answer really is in our text. Because Eli was guilty by what he failed to do. It was not what he did himself, but what he failed to do that was the downfall of Eli. 
He was not guilty of any positive, aggressive sin or evil. However, his sons were. The evil doings of his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, likewise were not hidden from God, obviously, because we cannot hide sin from God, but they were not hid from Eli himself. Eli knew their evil doings. Notice in 1 Samuel, the second chapter, and verse 12 says, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. Here's his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And God says they're sons of Belial, an idol. They did not know God. They did not know Yahweh. If we continue on, he says that the priest custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came, uh, the priest's servant came with the, with the flesh that was seething in the, and the flesh hook of three teeth in his hand, or with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he struck it in pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, all that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. Now that's the way in which the priest were going to be fed and the priest were paid. And it says, so they did in Shiloh and to all that the Israelites came thither. And also, or also before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to the roast for the priest, for he, for he will not have sodden flesh unto thee, but raw. In other words, the, the priest would take that three hook prong, while the meat was still in being cooked, and he would take of it at that time. But now then, they're saying, before it's being cooked, while it's still raw, you do this. And it, said, it goes on, if, in, <coughs> if any man said unto him, let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth. Then he would answer them, Nay, but thou shalt give me now. If not, I will take it by force. That's the sons of, of Eli. If you don't give it to me as I want it before it's cooked, then I'm going to take it by force. Now then notice verse 17. It says, Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before God, or before the Lord. For men abhorred the offering of the Lord. This was an offering being made to God. They were to put it in a kettle and they were to, to cook it and then after it was, basically after it was cooked, the priest would then get his portion. Hophni and Phinehas, on the other hand, said, no, we're not going to wait until it's cooked. We're going to take it before it's cooked while it's still raw. And if you object, then we'll take it by force. They didn't care anything about the offering of it to God. All they cared about was, them, was themselves. They thus abhorred the offering of the Lord. But then go on, and, and he says, But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with, linen, with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought, to him, brought it to him year by year. 
Then she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice, and Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give the seed of the woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And they went into their home, and the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel, <coughs> the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Now Eli says was very old, and heard. Now notice it. He heard all that his sons did in all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Here's the door of the tabernacle, where they would go in to offer their offerings to God, and here's Eli's sons, and Eli hears, your sons are laying with the women that come to the temple. His sons were horrible, ungodly people. But notice that Eli heard all that they were doing. They're cheating the people as far as, and God as far as the sacrifice, and the women they would go out and lay with. Eli knew about it. Later on in verse 23 and verse 24 then of 1 Samuel 2, it states, and he said unto them, Why do ye such things? This is Eli speaking to his sons. For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. So again, I've heard of all of these things. Why are you doing it? I hear your evil dealings with the people. It's an evil report that I've heard. And you have made the people to transgress to sin. So what we see is that here's Eli, a pious man, one that did good, and had, as far as we know, everything that we would want to see as far as a spiritual individual. And yet God's going to destroy him and his family. Why? He had complete knowledge of what his sons were doing. He was completely aware of the shame that they were bringing upon themselves, upon the priestly office which they were given to, upon God and upon the people themselves and making the people to sin. And he has told them, this is not good. You shouldn't be doing it. It's evil. But Eli's sin in reality, was that he failed to restrain them. And thus, Eli shared in their guilt and thus in their doom. Notice 1 Samuel 2 and verse 29. Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering? which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. You have honored your sons, God says to him, more than me. Why? Because he knew their sins, and he did not restrain them. And thus, by his lack of restraint, he honored his sons more than he honored God himself.
Paul would write in Ephesians 5 and verse 11, applies to all of us to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. <coughs> Eli, in failing to restrain his sons, became a partaker of their evil deeds. In 2 John, verses 9 through verse 11, John would say, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of, of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Now notice, here's someone who is abiding in the doctrine of Christ, but they receive into their house someone who is not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, and God says, you are now a partaker of their evil. Now we might say, now wait a minute, God, I didn't do that. God said, you're right, you didn't, but you became a partaker of it by when you receive them into your house, when you bid them God speak then you be, became a partaker of their evil. And so it is just as if you had done it yourself because there was no putting a stop to it. Eli, with his two sons, loved his sons. God is saying more than you love me. Jesus would say, as recorded in Mark 10 and verse 37, that he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's Eli's situation. Not someone who is wildly evil, in fact, we don't even find any evil in his life. He was a good, pious individual, a one who was himself a faithful priest unto God, a faithful judge for God. But God says, you honored your children, your sons, more than me. Why? Because he did not restrain them. we might ask, and we'll stop with this question and pick up word willing next week, why did he not restrain them? And we might ask the same question of us many times, why do not we do those things that are necessary to stop sin within our loved ones? This was the priest of God, judge. His sons were doing evil. He did not restrain them. He did not put a stop to it. And thus God's going to punish him and his house. When we see evil and we have the ability, we have the right to put a stop to it, and we fail to, then we honor those who are doing the sin more than we honor God. For whatever reason it might be. Now then, if you're not a Christian this morning, we would encourage you to obey that gospel of Jesus Christ that through your, your faith that you have that God is and that uh, Jesus Christ is God's Son, that he died for your sins. Turn away from those sins, that's, turn, that's repentance. Turning away from them to turn to live in God's appointed way. Doing so as God has set forth for us to do. And then 
upon that repentance, make a confession that you believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then we have the right at that point in time to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. We can wash that old life away and we can begin new as new creatures in Christ Jesus. If you have never obeyed that gospel, do so this morning. If you have, as a child of God, fallen away and you've not lived in such a way that God would be pleased with you, then repent of your sins and let us pray to God for the forgiveness of those sins. And he has promised that he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins if we will confess those sins. 1 John 1 and verse 9. So if we can help you in doing these things, we would encourage you to come as we stand and sing the invitation song.